Good morning, everybody, and thanks for, uh, for having me here. Uh, first one of the day, and um, to ease you into the day, um, I'll start with a not very technical talk, or not technical at all, I guess. Um, titled, uh, <laughs> What if we really assume breach? Um, <clears throat> and of course, I'll explain in a minute um, uh, why I chose that title. Um, first, maybe short introduction. Uh, I'm Kevin. Uh, I work for Deloitte. Um, as of February of this year, um, so only a few months basically, uh, focusing on uh, what we call security restoration, so mainly helping clients um, who are dealing with um, you know, the fallout of a large incident or serious red team or pen test findings um, and trying to you know, uh, improve their security very quickly in, in the first couple of months and then also get them into a larger, usually larger transformation uh, project. Um, Prior to joining Deloitte, uh, I worked for Fox IT for over seven years um, doing incident response and forensics. So I basically saw a lot of clients in um, the worst state you could encounter them. Um, but it gives you a, little, a lot of very interesting insights into um, what could go wrong and, and, and why it goes wrong as well, um, which is what I've also worked into this talk a bit, I guess. Um, so I'm going to talk about Assume Breach here uh, today. Um, you're probably all, all familiar with, with the, um, the mantra of, of assume breach. Um, you know, you basically assume that your prevention measures um, in terms of IT security are not going to keep out attackers forever. At some point, they will fail. Um, attackers will bypass it and, and enter your network, your infrastructure, um, and possibly cause all kinds of havoc. Um, so um, it's, it's something that you've been hearing for, for years now in the security industry and um, uh, something that you hear a lot of organizations claim that they're also doing. So they say, yeah, we're um, following this, this um, uh, attitude of assume breach and, and um, we worked it into our IT security. And what they usually tell you is, um, you know, out of the holy trinity of prevent, detect, respond, um, they're not only doing uh, prevention anymore, but they're moving a lot of effort into detection mainly and also um, effective response to, to any stuff they, they detect or any breaches that uh, could potentially occur. Um, so following this logic, um, why am I here doing this talk if everybody already knows what Assume Breach is and how you should, uh, you should handle um, if, if you want to follow that, uh, um, that train of thought? Um, it's because there's still a lot of stuff that goes wrong, I think, when organizations try to um, uh, work under the assumption of, of a breach that could happen at any moment. Um, so I mainly focus this talk around the topic of detection and uh, want to take you through some of the things first that I see usually go wrong in organizations. Um, and then, of course, also uh, hopefully provide some sort of a, a solution, a way of thinking that could hopefully overcome uh, a lot of these issues. So first thing um, that you often see that, that goes wrong is, is the scope of a lot of the detection mechanisms in organizations. So, um, I mean, any larger org organization these days will probably have a SIEM installed and either run it themselves or, or have some third party do it for them. Um, maybe they also have IDS or, or other clever stuff uh, running in their uh, infrastructure. Um, but what you often see is that these systems get set up and, and collect data just based on, on best effort or what's easy to collect or, or what's easy to grab or um, whatever people are familiar with. So, you know, any engineer will probably know about Windows event log, so it might be a logical thing to start collecting data uh, from Windows event logs and, and build rules around that and see if you can detect any, any uh, anomalies or, or weird behavior um, in that data set. Um, but it's not necessarily what's the most useful part to, to look at um, in, in your infrastructure. So um, there's usually, or there's often, I should say, no link between the actual business processes and the type of data that gets collected and analyzed um, in these detection uh, measures. Um, and then obviously, you know, just like these binoculars, you can only move them around within certain limits, um, but around there, there's all kinds of other stuff that you might not be seeing. And it's, it's basically an analogy for, for what uh, a lot of detection measures do within organizations. Another thing that you see is that, um, and, and this is obviously, obviously a very hot topic right now in, in InfoSec, is, is you know, um, having as much as possible uh, being performed by machines. 
So obviously we know the, 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 the basic detection stuff where you build rules and use cases and, and use it to detect um, anomalies in, in traffic or in logs and whatever. Um, there's also a big rise in, in all kinds of AI technology claiming to basically do more than humans ever could. Um, I'm not I'm not expert on the subject. I should say that, um, but until it's it's really proven technology, I think the the human factor in detection is is really important. Um, so what you see happen a lot is that detection measures are put in place, and every once in a while, maybe somebody adds some new rules to the, the rule base, and and you know ensures that some new things are being picked up. Um, but it's not an active feedback loop um, where there's also analysts on a regular basis, you know, going out doing manual threat hunts and, and trying to find bad stuff based on just their human expertise and, and their human knowledge and also their knowledge mainly of what drives the business and how the business works and what kind of applications and systems support that, uh, those processes. Um, so I think the feedback loop between threat hunting, which usually results in, in yeah, what you could call good hunts, useful stuff that you find while doing the hunting, that should be converted into new use cases for your detection mechanism, right? Um, but that doesn't happen a lot, especially with organizations um, having third parties doing the, the security monitoring for them. Um, you see that this is, uh, is, is often lacking, um, and it means that you're, you're not improving as fast as you could, I think. Third thing that you, you often see is what I would call um, monitoring in, an, in a hostile environment. Um, and it's not like the blue team you know, uh, gets harassed each day physically or whatever, uh, but it's more like the infrastructure is maybe not ready or suitable for uh, a very advanced detection. Um, and this could be caused by a number of reasons. For example, uh, a very flat and, and unsegmented network so that there's a lot of stuff going on in the same central place, um, so it's hard to, to uh, figure out what's what or what belongs to what or what correlates to other traffic. Um, unstructured networks where all kinds of different protocols and traffic are, are crossing each other over, over the same uh, um, uh, physical lines maybe. Um, so it's really hard to do decent detection if you don't have a good overview of what flows where. Um, we also see, especially where, where, where uh, you just deploy, uh, for example, IDS technology within clients, that there's still a lot of what we call um, low-hanging fruit in the network. So very easy, basic stuff that, you know, botnet malware or something like that that should already have been picked up long ago and removed, but is still there. And obviously, if there's a lot of noise like that, um, you're, it's really hard to look beyond that into traces of really more advanced attacks that you're probably looking for. And the final example that I'd like to, to mention here is that in a lot of case, cases, everybody accepts that detection should happen, but there's no real response readiness. So whenever a real alert or a possible you know, traces of a, a, an attack are found, um, doing the actual response might be really hard. So just last week, I was at a client um, where a guy in their blue team spent one and a half days trying to figure out what physical device um, was using a specific IP address that did some weird stuff that they saw on their seam. Well, you can imagine that in those one and a half days, the attacker might have moved over to all, of, all kinds of other places. Um, and so it was really hard to, to figure out where it was. And then the next issue we had was that once he informed um, the systems administrator, um, there was basically the, the, the owner of the device as well, um, that guy just wiped the device and reinstalled it. Um, removing any traces of, you know, uh, data that could possibly be investigated further. So, um, thinking about detection, you also need to be ready to respond, actually, and, and not just think, when I I'll find it, I'll, I'll just um, see what happens next. Another thing that, that, that might be not as um, obvious when you, you think about assume breach um, is the impact factor. So, uh, you know, we, we usually approach risk with, you know, the, the formula of, of uh, the chance that something happens times the impact, uh, if it happens. Um, and you see that that, that that impact factor is not always considered. I still think it's, it's a really important part of assume breach, because if you assume that attackers might bypass your prevention measures, um, it's only logical to also assume that at some point they might even... Uh, uh, pass by your detection measures and, and go by undetected. 
Um, so in that case, it's also important to think about what can I do to limit impact, um, or at least you know to slow down an attacker, make sure that he has to jump through a lot of hoops before he gets where he wants to be. And again, this should usually be really business driven. And uh, I think we all know the idea of focusing on, on crown jewels, your most important assets and, and, and data and systems in, in the infrastructure and trying to um, think about how you can protect uh, those uh, a bit more. But I think it, 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 it goes uh, a few layers beyond that and you should really see the entire chain, maybe from you know, phishing uh, uh, an employee and, and, and getting access to his laptop all the way to these crown jewels and see where you can uh, you can improve. Um, and if you um, think about and, and actually work on, on um, trying to prevent a serious impact from a breach, that will also usually help you improve your detection again because it will take an attacker more time um, to actually get where he wants to. So um, again, that leaves you more room for, for um, detection usually. I think one final thing, and then I want to move more to a positive side, like how can we, we key, uh, could we uh, approach this and remediate this, um, is, is what can we learn from real, actual real life incidents? And as I said, I've, I've been doing it for uh, uh, over seven years, and, and you see a lot of weird stuff happening. Um, obviously, especially a couple of years ago, you still saw a lot of organizations who didn't have the assumed breach mindset at all. They were just surprised that an attacker got in, even though they had this expensive firewall and antivirus, etc. Um, but if you if you look more closely at the incidents, there's there's some things that I think are also applicable to just day-to-day -day blue team operations. <clears throat> um, and I think one of the uh, the important things I learned is that, for example, if you have a Especially if you have more advanced attackers, think the really good criminals or, or even nation states that might be in your network. Um, you might need to observe before you really act. So, and what I mean by that is, is you might not want to kick out the um, attackers at the first opportunity you have, at the first anomaly you, you spot. Uh, but you might want to wait out a bit and, and see what they're heading for, see what they're doing, see what kind of or what areas of the infrastructure they've already um, uh, um, infiltrated or, or entered. Um, so did you get a better understanding of what they're working on and, and, and where they're at? Um, because I've actually seen some organizations who just, you know, kick them out at the first opportunity. And, and usually that's what the business side wants, right? So that's, that's always an interesting discussion. Uh, but you should be ready for that as a, as a blue team, I think. Um, and if you kick them out, they might, you know, still be in other parts of the network that you, you haven't really covered um, because they're using different uh, um, software or malware there to, to, you know, keep a presence, stuff like that. Um, so waiting it out and, and finding the right time to start remediating and, and cleaning up, um, that's an important aspect that you also need to take into account with just, you know, regular, uh, regular detection. Um, another thing I see is that um, a lot of organizations jump into doing more detection and they want to start out with the most advanced, complex stuff that they can, can buy or can get, um, which is really not usually the best thing to do. Uh, I mean, attackers are, are probably lazy as well, um, just economics, right? If, if you can get somewhere easy, why uh, try and use, do it the complex way? Um, so most incidents are not a chain of seven zero days that nobody knows about and, and are used in, in, in insanely advanced ways. Um, no, it's usually just very, very simple stuff that everybody could have come up with, uh, but just happened to be a, you know an unlucky chain of events, uh, you could say, um, that led to a full compromise. Um, and that's something to take into account when doing detection because... Um, that means that you also should make sure that you first have you know, the, the basic stuff under control be before you start looking for way more advanced topics. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second as well. Um, I think another one, but it's, it's I, to be honest, I'm, I'm on the fence myself whether this is, is really something we should do as, as a blue team in day-to-day -day operations. Um, but again, the more advanced attackers will probably be interested in what the blue team has to say amongst themselves, like what are they focusing their detection on, their, their actions right now, what are they looking for, what are they developing. 
Um, so, I mean, it's no surprise that attackers will probably be interested in communications in a, in a company, but they might also be interested in what the defenders are, are doing and trying to do. Um, so, in, in larger incidents, it's not uncommon to set up separate communication channels uh, for the blue team and maybe external parties they're talking to, etc. Um, but I think depending on your, or your threat profile and, and, and what kind of actors you might be up against, it might be sensible to think about whether you need to um, use safeguards like that, separate channels, um, as, as a default maybe. And I mean, it's not a lot of work to do, um, but it's something you need to think about. So, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff that, that can go wrong. Um, but how do, you, how do you fix that? Um, actually, I think it's, it's um, not very hard per se, but it requires kind of a different mindset. And you need to be able to step out from only looking at the technical side of things and make sure that you also look at, at the business and, and the process side of things and, and how your organization actually works. And um, uh, maybe to give an example, what you, what you often see, we all know this one, right? Um, the kill chain, there's, there's numerous variants of it, but um, I, I tend to see the Lockheed Martin one um, a lot when I talk to clients, um, where they've defined all these steps in you know, the, the, the path of an, uh, an attack, basically. Um, but what bothers me about this one, if you use it to model uh, your defenses against it, is that, um, you know, first of all, if you put it more like in a, on a kind of a time relative scale, these three steps, delivery, exploitation, installation, they'll be usually pretty close together and, and might only take minutes, right? Uh, and then after that comes a very long time uh, where a lot could happen. And if you look at it, um, honestly, I think these steps, there's some stuff you might detect, but in all honesty, there's way more room for detection in, in the steps after that. But with a lot of models, um, that's, that's not really divided into uh, very clear, clear steps. Um, and so if you're going to model your detection on this, it's going to be quite messy because you're going to say, well, to detect command and control, I can do those 50 things, for example. Um, but it's, it's, it's messy. So um, I'm a big fan of using a model like this, the MITRE 1 attack, <clears throat> um, where they basically only start at exploitation, so everything before that is, is not covered or irrelevant for, irrelevant for this model. Um, but it's a very useful model for, for detection and response in my view, um, because they take these 10 categories of, of stuff that attackers can do, and mind you, these are not necessarily in the order that an attacker will do this, um, could be switched around. Um, but what this provides you with is um, a lot more uh, um, it gives you the capability from a technical side at least to uh, provide more detail on the areas where your detection is good or where it's bad or you know um, where you're already top notch um, because what MITRE also does and and obviously you can you can uh, modify this or, or use it in your own way but MITRE has an entire wiki behind this where they say okay for lateral movement uh, we've seen these, uh, I don't know, 50 techniques that were used in, and per technique they list the campaign. So it could be, uh, you know, APT 28 or whatever. Um, and they say, that's where it was used. Um, it involves this technique. They even say what known detection techniques are possible. And for some, it's also known, well, it's, it's really hard or almost impossible to detect. Um, and based on that, you can, this is another tool that MITRE provides, open source tool, the carrot. Um, and, and so at the top here, you see those 10 categories, and then below that, I'm not sure if you can read it, but it's all the techniques. So um, for, uh, let's say, persistence, they list a number of stuff, things that they uh, know uh, happen in the wild, like uh, setting up scheduled tasks to achieve persistence. <clears throat> um, you see some colors here as well. So this is just an example where Red means um, we're not covering that with our current detection or, or even prevention measures. And yellow means, yeah, we're probably covering some of that. And there could even be green squares where you're pretty sure that you're covering almost any attempt of, of using such a technique. Um, now, looking at this, you, you're probably wondering, this is still very technical. How does it help me um, um, involve the business side of things? Well, what you should, should add to this layer, basically, is... Um, uh, uh, yeah, what I'd call a scenario analysis or a more in-depth analysis of what the business processes are that are critical for an organization. 
Um, and below that, you can usually put like the systems and applications that support those processes. And when you do that, you can also start thinking about what are the attack paths that an attacker could use to you know, uh, get into those business processes and achieve some kind of goal. Which means you also need to know which actors you're up against, you know, which actors are interested in those uh, attack paths, um, and, and you know, what level of sophistication they might have and how they would work in, in uh, achieving those attack paths. But if you have the attack paths, that's where this basically comes in, because that's where you can think of, okay, so I've got this Windows machine here that's critical to this process. Um, so if it's interesting to an attacker, he probably want to achieve persistence. So what kind of Windows persistence techniques do I know? Am I covering them in my detection on this specific system or not? Um, and if I'm missing some stuff that I think is pretty vital, let's see if we can work towards remediating that and adding maybe uh, data collection and, and detection uh, on that specific, specific system on um, the, the relevant log files. Um, so I think that's a, um, a really key part of, of improving and, and what really, what's really nice about such an overview, of course, such a matrix, matrix um, is that you can basically see what your current state is, what kind of stuff are you detecting, um, and you can also show improvement over time, of course. So, you know, hopefully more red squares will turn yellow and then uh, perhaps even turn, uh, turn green. Um, so I think this is, this is vital to focusing your, your detection and response operations. Um, and, and for some things, you could even add a little bit more prevention. But let's focus on the detection side. Um, and based on that, you can um, uh, ensure that you're, you know, coming back to the scope slide that I had at the beginning, you can ensure that you're looking at the right scope. And it might be a much smaller scope than you're maybe looking at right now but it could be a much more useful scope than the larger one you're dealing with. And this obviously also helps in you know, staffing issues and, and bringing down the number of alerts that you get and have to analyze, um, because you're much more focused on what's really important for, uh, for the organization. Now there's one final uh, um, issue that, that you often see, even if you do all of this right, is that you actually need real attacks to determine whether it all works, right? So if you're one of the lucky ones who maybe doesn't get attacked uh, uh, for over a year, how does the blue team know that they're doing the right things and actually detecting stuff? Well, the answer is easy, right? You, you simulate the attack. So um, I think we all know and, and, and all are aware that, that red teaming is an important part of, of building your, up your defenses. Um, but what you see a lot in practice is that the red team only does what, what the red team mainly wants to do is, is usually break stuff, you know, get in and, and um, show that, that they've achieved all of the, uh, the objectives um, and then, you know, provide a list of, of how the attack went, what path they chose, what, what um, uh, tools and, and methods they used and, and say, blue team, here you go, good luck fixing it. Um, and it's usually not a very constructive way of, of dealing with it, of course. Um, so I'm a big proponent of, of what a lot of people call purple teaming. So bringing the red and blue team together, um, maybe even during the red team already. So have specific points in time where you do a debrief of the blue team and already tell them maybe how far you got. Um, so that they can, you know, readjust some of their detection measures, uh, focus again on, on where the red team might be so that you prevent that the red team spent six weeks on, on an attack with the blue team being completely in the dark. I mean, that's not useful to anyone except for the confidence level of the red team, probably. Um, so you want to make sure that the blue team also has got ha work on their hands and, and also becomes very aware of the stuff they're still missing. Um, and, 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 you know, basically you want to verify that this matrix um, is actually in the state that it that you think it is. So it, it could also help it purple teaming to select specific techniques or detection areas that you want to test and, and make sure that the red team specifically targets those um, and does a good debrief of the blue team in, uh, um, to help them, again, improve the detection. And you know, if you, you're really going to the more mature levels of doing this, um, this could be like a feedback loop that you go through several times where 
after debriefing the blue team, you might want to try the attack again because they've improved their detection and see if you can still pass uh, by some points of, of the defense. Um, and then again do the debrief. So you know it, it, it becomes kind of an, an arm race, uh, arms race of, of uh, attack and defense where you try to constantly improve each other. Um, and it's usually a, a way more healthy situation for red and blue team to be in um, because they can more actively learn from each other. Right, so I've, I've, I've come to the end of my, my talk here. Um, some, some key takeaways. Um, I, as I said, to really assume breach, so to really live under this, uh, this assumption, um, is to know what kind of paths your attackers are, are likely to take. And, and you, you take that from looking at the business side of things. Um, I think you should focus on, on defending those paths first, adding prevention and detection um, on those specific paths that are critical to the business. And, and you better do these right and, and just ignore the others for now than you know, do an entire infrastructure uh, half-heartedly or, or um, uh, without a lot of success. Um, then it's also important to you know, test, measure, adjust uh, whatever you're doing, um, preferably through purple teaming, I'd say, um, because no one gets it right straight away. Obviously, you will always you know, cover some stuff using default rules and, and basic stuff you can come up with yourself. Um, but the human creativity is, is, you know, it knows no limits, I guess. So there's always ways, finding ways around the defenses, and you really need to, to prove that and test that to really um, get your defenses to the next level. Um, and I think a key point in that until, you know, AI basically rules the world is that you need humans to, to do so. Um, and with that, I'd uh, like to end my talk. Any questions? Does it work? Yeah? yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so you mentioned about um, the advanced attackers, that maybe it's a good idea to let them go into your network a bit and then do things about it. But how do you convince like the C-level executives to allow something like this? Because it's, it's a risk. Also because you don't know it's an advanced attacker until you've actually looked into it. So how do you yeah. deal with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a catch-22, I agree. Um, so usually you have, have some, some concrete leads or, yeah, well, if you only have an inkling that it could be an advanced attacker, I agree this discussion will be very hard and, and even I might suggest, well, let's just get rid of it. Um, but if you have some leads that it is advanced, maybe because it's um, new malware you found that you know isn't on virus total yet, could be, could be interesting lead, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then, so I've, I've been in discussions like that a few times. I've not always won them. <laughs> um, but the, the times I did, um, I think it was very important to explain what could be the consequences of remediating right now, which is that the attacker might still be in a network, but you have no visibility at all on them anymore. And it also depends, of course, on the type of inf impact that you're experiencing or likely to experience in the near future. Um, so especially with nation states, if it's, you know, uh, espionage or something like that, also depending on the organization, of course, um, it might be not that terrible and, and, and you know because sometimes they might be in there for months or years already so you know the worst damage has already been done and it's just just stealing information not bringing down your infrastructure or whatever um, so in those cases I think you you do have a, a good opportunity to convince them that you might want to watch them a, a bit more before you kick them out to ensure that you can do an effective as effective remediation as possible Hi. I was just wondering if your work got a bit busier after the latest shadow broker releases and uh, uh, all these advanced malware and stuff. A, a bit busier in, in what way? Yeah, in cleaning up stuff and helping clients with. Uh, um, did not do it on a good. It, did it, not do a good patching job and stuff. So um, yeah, I think in general we get busier like every <laughs> every quarter almost, um, uh, which is. 
not necessarily get to do with developments like that, but just also general awareness of, of the security will have to be um, um, approached more seriously. Um, what you usually see when, when stuff like that breaks and, and gets in the news is that there's a, a, a number of clients who, who get, you know, um, do some phone calls to us and, and want to get a bit of more info and like how relevant is this to us and, and you know, how serious is this, uh, uh, should I take this trap? Um, but I think overall, you know, the, the biggest bumps in, in busyness are when stuff like WannaCry or non patia you know, stuff like that happens, of course, um, because that's when there's actual impact. And I think when there's just the threat of potential future impact, it's only for the mature clients, more mature clients who worry about that. And others just think, I don't know what it means. It's probably not relevant to me. <laughs> Okay, so I think we need to move on to the next right. session. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you.